Manzanar, Manzanar became an internment camp to talk about what was happening in America. Marissa, this is Rosie, and this is Elisa, and we're here to tell you about before the war. Japanese first immigrated to the U.S. in the 1880s. They're, they, the first generation, the Issei, were not allowed to become citizens. Their children, though, the Nisei, were citizens by birth. Because of racial prejudice and economic fear of challenges, they decided to create laws. Right, there were laws actually that were against Japanese Americans and also people from other countries. Uh, there were also a lot of attitudes, public attitudes, like you saw on the billboard. Um, but there were, there were laws, like in 1908, they had something called the Gentleman's Agreement, where the U.S. government and the Japanese government decided to limit immigration. In 1913, there was an alien land law that said Issei, people like Rosie's parents, couldn't own land in this country. And then in 1924, they passed an act called the Immigration Act of 1924. And that banned all further immigration from Japan until well after World War II. And Marissa, what's important about that 1924 date? Because anyone who had been here on December 7th, 1941, the day Pearl Harbor was attacked, had been here since at least 1924. And how many people were there here? In the 1940s, more than 126,000 Japanese Americans lived in the U.S. 88% lived on the West Coast, and two-thirds of those were citizens born in the U.S., like Rosie. Rosie, do you remember anything about December 7th? Yes, we were shocked when we heard. And my, we were scared also because our parents showed so much fear. So what we did was listen to the radio for the latest news and bulletin. We stayed indoors because we were scared to go out. Thank you, Rosie. Now, what's the real story behind December 7th? What happened? What's the story? The United States entered World War II when Japan attacked a military base called Pearl Harbor in Hawaii. President Franklin Roosevelt spoke these unforgettable words. Yesterday, December 7th, 1941, a date which will live in infamy, the United States of America was suddenly and deliberately attacked by naval and air forces of the Empire of Japan. Thousands of people died during this attack. The United States entered World War II, and many people, especially those on the West Coast, believed that Japanese Americans were a security threat. Thank you for joining us at Block 14. Today we're going to be talking about what took place after Pearl Harbor. Just two and a half months after the bombing of Pearl Harbor, Executive Order 9066 was signed. Jacob, can you tell me which president signed the executive order? President Franklin D. Roosevelt. That's right. And what did the order actually specify? What did it talk about? It said that all people of Japanese ancestry were to report to these re relocation camps. Relocation camps? What were those and where were they? There, they were in California, Arizona, Oregon, and Washington. As well as in Arkansas. They were all over the western part of the United States. And this affected Japanese Americans in the Pacific region. How did they know where they needed to report? They would have seen one of these signs on every uh, telephone pole on every corner. That's correct, Jacob. This affected someone like a former attorney here, Saburo Sasaki. Saburo, can you tell us how this affected your family? What we had was two weeks' notice to get our everything settled. We had to store things. My father had to sell a tractor, sell the horses, all the farm implementations. And they hired the city of Los Angeles transit buses, and they bused us here to Manzanar. That was April 28, 1942. So you had to leave your classroom, your teachers, and your friends behind? Absolutely. I can't imagine what that would be like, but let's try to imagine. Now it's your turn. We're going to join Sophia and Callie in the auditorium for the Your Turn activity. Over to you, ladies. Thanks, Carrie. I'm Sophia, and this is Callie, and we're going to be doing the Your Turn activities. This time, we're going to be working on the Arriving at Manzanar sheet. And your teacher should have handed you this sheet, but if they didn't, you could just use a piece of notebook paper to answer the questions. 
Today's question is what personal belongings would you miss the most? I know I would miss my mom's cooking and my music. What would you miss, Callie? Well, I would definitely miss going fishing and camping, and I would also miss my paintings and drawings a lot. But I think most of all, I would miss my friends. You know, it's funny you would mention that, because we heard about a guy called Ralph Lazo who went into camp just to be with his friends, and he wasn't even Japanese. He was Mexican-Irish. And the story how he got to camp without having any bit of Japanese in him was that he told his father he was going to go to camp to support his friends because he thought what the government was doing was wrong. So that's why he went to camp was to support his friends. He was very popular at camp. Um, he was the most popular guy in his high school and he emceed many of the school dances. And many of you across the, across the country have sent in pictures of what you would miss the most. And we're seeing a lot of animals or pets. And I know I would miss my dog Sage a lot if I went away. And also, families were separated during this time, and I would hate it if I was separated from my family. Are there any pictures that you can relate to that you would miss a lot? No, I don't have any pets, but I could probably relate to missing all of my electronics, like my iPod, my digital camera, and those types of things. Yeah. And now we're going to go to Jeff and Alex for a question and answer session. Okay, Sophia and Callie, thank you very much. We're back out here on the baseball field, and uh, I don't know about you guys, but I think that I would miss my nice warm heat at home. It's chilly out here this morning, isn't it, Alex? Yeah, it's freezing. It is. I, I popped a hole in one of the fingers of my glove, but, you know, the hardships here at Manzanar were a lot worse than that. We're uh, directly in front of one of the guard, tower, guard towers. You can probably see it behind us. And we've got some calls now that are coming in on the line. So let's take a look, or Alex, if you can tell us who is the first caller that we have today. It's Smith Smith's from Texas. All right, Smith's from Texas. Go right ahead. No. Smith's from, from Texas. Texas. Um, I hear you there. You want to go ahead and ask your question? Uh, yeah. Um, a non-Japanese <clears throat> Allowed to visit people in the internment camps. Smiths, could you repeat that question one more time for us? A little um, bit louder. Were non Japanese allowed to visit people in the internment camps? Okay, Smith, that's a very good question. Were non Japanese sent to the internment camps or allowed to visit the internment camps? To answer that question, I'm going to send it back inside to Elisa Lynch, who's the chief of interpretation here. Perhaps Elisa and Rosie can help us answer that. That's a great question. You know, there were people, actually, there were people who were not Japanese American who were in the camps. There were 219 of them in all 10 camps. But yes, non-Japanese Americans could come and visit Japanese Americans in the camp. Did you ever have any visitors, Rosie? Yes, we had our music teacher in junior high school, Miss Fisher. And when she came, she brought this beautiful cake she baked, and we thoroughly enjoyed it. All right, so back to you, Alex and uh, Jeff. Okay, Lisa, thank you very much. In just a few moments, you're going to be privileged to meet a gentleman named Pete Mitsui. Pete was one of the great baseball players here at Manzanar. In fact, he even helped build this baseball field. He brought the San Fernando Aces from the San Fernando Valley who played here at Manzanar. We're going to go back to the phones now, and we have another caller, Alex. Okay. It's Caitlin from Texas. All right, Caitlin, you're on the line. Go right ahead. What happened to the stuff that they left behind? What happened to the things that they left behind? Carrie, can we go to you out of Block 14? You're with Saburo and some of the other students to talk again about what kinds of things they left behind. That's a great question. I think Saburo Sasaki here, who actually had to leave things behind, could answer that question best. Go ahead. The things that we left behind were things like pets. We were not allowed to have photographs, uh, cameras, radios. Uh, the only thing that we can bring into the camp was one suitcase that we carried. Everything else had to be in storage or sold. Now, farmers had to sell their crops, their tractors, their horses, and there were many housewives that could not store or uh, carry their dishware, so they had to sell them. And a lot of them were you know, on a, like a fire sale, a 10 cents on the dollar. That's a great answer, Saburo. Thanks a lot. Back to you, Jeff and Alex. Carrie and Saburo, thank you. Now we have another caller, Alex. Yeah, it's it's Adrian from Kansas. Adrian from Kansas, go right ahead. Hi, I've got a question. Mm -hmm. 
My question is, when the families reach Manzanar camp, were they allowed to stay together or were they forced to separate? Were they allowed to stay together or were they forced to separate? Let's go back inside to the interpretive center. Elisa and Rosie, can you help us with that one? So, Rosie, the question is the caller would like to know whether or not families were allowed to stay together in camp or were they separated? No, we were all together. And uh, my cousins and all, we were about 26 of us in a clan and we were all together. So mm -hmm. what would happen when you came into camp is they would usually put eight people per barrack apartment and so you might be spread out through several apartments but you wouldn't be forcibly separated. Mm -hmm. uh, the exception to that would be after Pearl Harbor the FBI and the Department of Justice arrested some uh, primarily Issei men and they were taken to Department of Justice camp. So there were people who were forcibly separated from their families um, in some cases, they were able to rejoin them later. But once you were here at Manzanar, your mm -hmm. family would probably be together if housing allowed. Together. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. Back to you, Jeff and Alex. I was too sure. All right, Elisa and Rosie, thank you very much. Now, we've heard from Rosie, we've heard from Saburo. We're going to meet Pete Mitsui in just a few moments about how they got to camp. So there's a little bit more of a story there. And for that, let's go to what's the story about getting to camp. The Japanese Americans forced to leave the West Coast homes for war relocation centers was not permitted to take all their belongings. Each person was allowed to bring what they could carry, usually two suitcases full of personal items. Many were forced to sell everything else at prices dramatically lower than the, the item was worth. Once packed, the trip to Manzanar began. Do you know where they were going or how long they would be gone? They simply loaded into a bus and started driving hundreds of miles into the California desert. Manzanar was one of the 10 war relocation centers spread throughout the country. The first buses started arriving in the spring of 1942, with the entire relocation of more than 112,000 Japanese Americans complete by November. Okay, so, I have a question for you. When you had to leave for camp, what did you miss most, like, that you had to leave behind? Well, of course, uh, I missed the freedom of the outside world, first, most of all, but since uh, we were in Manzanar camp now, I miss uh, baseball. Uh, I think I miss baseball most of all because I was, prior to the war, I was so involved in the game. Uh, I started playing baseball when I was 13 years old, made the letter in high school, and uh, I was really instrumental in the formation of the uh, San Fernando Club baseball team. Uh, And with the formation of the Nisei Baseball uh, League, uh, uh, we joined the, uh, uh, the, the league and there were so many people, so many teams that was uh, involved that there was two divisions, A and B. And since the San Fernando Aces were so young, they put us in the B division. Next year we won the championship, so they put us in the upper A division in the strong uh, teams. And uh, with uh, our San Fernando Aces advanced so much that we were quite a force in the league for years afterwards. Then... Okay, Pete, thank you. Okay, um, Mirsa, I, I think you had a question for Rosie, right? Thanks, Alex. Um, so Rosie, we just heard from Pete what he missed the most. What about you? What did you miss the most? Oh, I missed two things. The first one is the ice cream sundae, any flavor, and also going to the movies after Sunday church, and, for, and then take an extra five cents for a candy bar. Thanks, Rosie. Back to you, Alex. Um, thanks, Marissa. Okay, Alex, let's talk a little bit about what we've learned in this segment. There are some very important lessons that have been explained to us by Elisa, Rosie, Carrie, Saburo, and some of the other students. Can you kind of recap things that we've learned? Well, um, 
We talked about anti-Japanese sentiment, or in other words, Japanese racism. We also talked about Pearl Harbor and its bombing, and also the exclusion order 9066. We also talked about how some of the Issei and Nisei got to camp. Okay, so exclusion order, you were talking about the executive order 9066, right? That mm -hmm. was on February the 19th, 1942, right after the bombing of Pearl Harbor, and that's what brought all of the Japanese to the internment camps. And uh, interestingly enough, next week is the 65th anniversary of that executive order, right? Mm -hmm. That's why we're doing the program today. So we've talked about what life was like before the camp, how they got to camp, and now let's talk about what life was like during the camp. We're out here at Block 14, and we're going to be taking a look at what it was like to live in a block. Well, we're going to take a look at what it was like to live in a barrack, use the latrines, eat in a mess hall or dining hall, and just everyday life. But we're going to start it off with Marissa in the auditorium. Marissa, over to you. Thanks, Carrie. Um, I'm here in what a barrack would have looked like, wooden walls, wooden floors. And then, of course, when people arrived here, they immediately made their own um, adjustments, improvements. They used army blankets as a divider between the walls and they also used scrap wood to make their own furniture. I'm not sure if it looked as good as that. Uh, but later in the late 1942 they upgraded a little bit by adding maroon linoleum on the floors. Back to you. Well we're here at block 14 and I'm walking towards the entrance of a bed. Now, you can see what I'm pointing at is some uh, walk what that the Tony said. Now if you walk straight into a bed you'll find that there's four different apartments. Each apartment is 20 by 25 feet in area. They have eight cots and, and a light bulb hanging from the ceiling in the apartment. Now, if there's two families in there, they separated the apartment by putting a military blanket in between. You can see I didn't mention anything about a uh, bathroom or refrigerator. That's because they didn't have room for that. They just had room for cots, maybe some luggage. Now, if I was hungry in the morning, where would I go, Lydia? You'd go to the mess hall, and behind us is what one would look like and it was two barracks put together that would serve hundreds of people their three meals a day. But the food they had there wasn't really what they were used to. Used to usually they would have rice and vegetables and fruits and fish, but here they had sauerkraut and canned foods and syrupy foods like apple butter and marmalade, so they didn't like it at all. Well, what happens, Lydia, when you eat foods that you're not used to? You get sick and you have to go to the bathroom. And when you have to go to the bathroom, what you found in camp, but there were lines at the latrine. So let's head over to Jacob and Sabrina. We're going to run over and show you what a latrine looked like. Come on, guys. Right here is a shower, and then right here is a hot tub. You'd have to rinse off and clean in the shower before you went and soaked in the hot tub. And right here is one of the old bolts that would have held up a big cement wall for a divider right here. And over here are the toilets, which there are only four on each side in the men's latrine. And in the women's latrine, there are only five on each side. And show them how close together you are, guys. And there wouldn't be any dividers right here. There'd only be a big cement wall right back here. So, Saburo, what was it like for you to live here in Manzanar? Well, we had our own police department. We had our own fire department. Uh, it was. We had our own hospital. We had two uh, vegetable farms. We had a pig farm, a chicken farm. Uh, we had a co-op here. We had a, a salon for the ladies, a barber shop for the men. We had a shoe repair shop. In other words, we were a, a really a self-sufficient, all uh, handled by internees. All right, thanks a lot, Saburo, for sharing. We're going to toss it over to Jeff and Alex for a question and answer period. Thanks a lot. Okay. Hey, uh, Saburo, I have a question for you. Now, would you have stood in line for apple butter and marmalade? Well, that's one of the things that we were not used to, apple butter and marmalade. And, but here's a, a quick story. My father was a cook. And as a cook, he had advanced information as to what blocks had what menu. And so there would be four or six of us. We would run from block to block to find the best menu. Okay. Well, people are lining up on the phones again, Saburo. We've got some more callers who are waiting to ask their questions. Who's up, Alex? It's Audrey from Texas. Go ahead, Audrey. 
Audrey from Texas, you're up. Did the Chinese ever get mixed up with the Japanese and get put in an internment camp? Audrey, thank you for that question. Let's go to Elisa Lynch inside the auditorium. Elisa, did the Chinese ever get mixed in with the Japanese and did they come here to Manzanar or any of the internment camps? You know, Audrey, there weren't Chinese that were mixed up with Japanese who came to the camps. There were some Chinese, uh, people of Chinese ancestry who came to camps if their husbands or their wives were of Japanese ancestry. They would have been among the 219, quote, voluntary interns in the camps. But you know, during World War II, Chinese and Koreans and Filipinos and a lot of other Asian Americans would actually wear buttons on their shirt that would say, I am Chinese, because they were afraid of being mistaken for being Japanese. Uh, but uh, to my knowledge, I don't think there were any people who were mistakenly put into camp. So back to you, Alex and Jeff. Thank you, Elisa. Alex is here, ready to play a ball game. Who's up at bat now, Alex? Um, now we have Sarah from Tennessee. Sarah from Tennessee, you're up. Sarah. Hi, Sarah. It's your question. No. Well, it appears that maybe Sarah's not on the line right now. We have Megan from Texas, who is Reagan from Texas. I'm sorry, Reagan. Go right ahead. Did any Japanese try to escape camp, and what happened to them? Okay, Reagan. I think your question is: Did any Japanese try to escape from the camp, and what happened to them? Elisa, could you help us with that? Well, here at Manzanar, uh, people would leave the camp, uh, but it was usually to go fishing or picnicking in the mountains. Because of the geography of the Owens Valley, there really wasn't too many places that Japanese Americans could go. And so there were not any, quote, escapes from Manzanar. But in, here at Manzanar and in several of the other camps, there were people who were shot for getting too close to the barbed wire, including uh, one of the guys you learned about on our website, Hikoji Takeuchi. Uh, so you could be shot for leaving camp, but here at Manzanar, uh, most of the people who left camp were leaving temporarily. And then, you know, later in the war, after 1942, they started relaxing uh, some of the restrictions and people were allowed to get passes to go out to a picnic area as long as they came back by night. Thanks, Reagan. Back to you guys. Elisa, Alex, who's up? It's now Ben from New York. Ben, ben? from New York. Go ahead, Ben. Where, 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 where are the guards polite to the internees? Ben, could you repeat that one more time? Where are the guards polite to the internees? Where are the guards polite to the internees? Let's go out to block 14 where Carrie is with Saburo. Saburo and Carrie, what are your recollections of that? Saburo, go ahead. The guards were very polite. Uh, they were uh, MPs, uh, and I think that uh, they recognized their position, they recognized our position, and they were very polite and courteous. Thank you for sharing, Saburo. Back to you, Jeff and Alex. Well, the calls are coming in fast and furious now. Alex, who's up? It's Katie from Maine. Katie, all the way up in Maine. What's your question for us today? Yeah. Where were they allowed, were they allowed to keep their customs, such as food they ate and religion? Katie, your question is, were they allowed to keep their customs regarding their food and their religion? Back into the Interpretive Center in the auditorium with Elisa is Rosie. Rosie, could you help us answer that? Rosie, Katie, would like to, Katie from Maine would like to know if you were allowed to keep your customs like food and religion while you were in camp. Well, yes, the religion, we were able to keep our own religion. And as far as food, we, were, we just ate what we were fed. But if you wanted something extra, you can go to the canteen and purchase whatever they had available. Thanks, Katie. Back to you, Jeff and Alex. Who's up, Alex? It's Donna from Kansas. All the way out in Kansas. Donna, your question is? I wondered if the adults were required to do certain jobs at the camp or if they could just fend for themselves. And was there a way for them to earn money? OK. Um, to Block 14, Carrie Saburo, I know that you were a child when you were here at Manzanar, but what do you recall of the adults working in the camp? There were three classifications unskilled, skilled, and professional. And so there was a pay level, and it was $12, uh, $16, and $19 per month. And <clears throat> the reason for that pay, uh, pay scale was that they did not want the professional people to get paid more than $19 a month, because then they would be making more than the buck private that was guarding us. 
That's a great answer, Saburo. Adults could choose if they wanted to work in camp or not work, but there were plenty of jobs to be had. Thank you for your question. Back to you, Jeff and Alex. On the baseball field, I mentioned, Alex, that this is the field that you helped clear a few days ago with some of the other students. Mm -hmm. uh, that was pretty hard work, wasn't it? Yep. Well, you know, adapting to life Ooh. in camp was hard as well. Let's go now to the Interpretive Center, where Chief of Interpretation Elisa Lynch is with Rosie and the students to talk about adapting to life in camp. You know, there were a lot of changes in camp between when people first arrived in 1942 and when they left in 1945. What were some of those changes, Marissa? Well, by the time, by 1945, they had the high school, they had the elementary school, and they also had grammar school. But then, of course, they also had activities such as baseball and football. They also had clubs, such as the Manzanites, which my grandfather and Rosie's brother was in. Um, Rosie, do you remember any changes? Oh, one of the major things from the beginning was be the beautiful Japanese garden, which was developed at the Merritt Park, and, and the, all the courts and baseball field, and the beautiful lawns, and gardens that were, appeared between the barracks. Those were just beautiful. As Rosie mentioned, one of the dramatic changes was gardens. So what's the story behind those gardens? There are very few obvious clues in Manzanar's landscape that tell us 10,000 people lived here for three and a half years. However, you can still wander the site and find remnants of Japanese gardens. Japanese gardens are representative of nature and were created by internees at Manzanar to find beauty in their surroundings and provide a peaceful, restful place away from the harsh day-to-day -day camp life. These gardens were once lush, green oases with flowers, flowing water, rock formations, and places to relax. When the camp was occupied, there were eight major gardens spread all over the camp and hundreds of smaller gardens that internees created outside their barracks. Hello and welcome back to Your Turn. This time we'll be focusing on life in Manzanar and if you were an internee, what were some of the activities that you would do to pass the time? Sophia, what were some of the activities people did within the camp? Well, Callie, a lot of kids would probably go and hang out at the basketball courts. Some of them would um, go to the kendo and judo dojos to keep up their traditions of their Japanese heritage and a lot of people would probably go and watch basketball or baseball games. Sophia, if you're an internee, what would you do to pass the time? Well, I would probably go and um, hang out at the basketball courts and just see all of my friends, you know, and maybe even do some crafts. How about you, Callie? What'd you do? Well, I would definitely play softball, and I would try to get into some painting and drawing activities to get my mind off of being interned in the camp with barbed wire all around me day after day. Yeah, that'd be really hard. And now we're going to go to Daniel and Saburo out at Block 14 to see what Saburo did for fun and relaxation in camp. As a seven-year-old, one of the favorites was playing marbles. You know, all you needed was a few marbles, some flat land, a round circle, and a lot of participants. Go ahead. All right. Now you go with the bus stop. The object here is to knock the marble out of the circle. See, if you kids at home, if you guys have marbles too, just draw a circle in the sand, get a triangle out of marbles and start shooting them at it. Try to knock those marbles out of the circle. Well, back to you, Marissa. Daniel? So, we just heard from Saburo what he did for fun and relaxation. Rosie, what about you? Well, for a 16-year-old, I was very thrilled to be able to be part of the Dusty Chicks baseball team, which is the champs. And we went to dances and I went to movies, visited friends. But I must tell you, no one wanted the catcher position, so I volunteered. <laughs> Thanks, Rosie. So we just heard that Rosie played baseball. So let's find out more about baseball in the camps. Alex, Pete, Jeff? Okay, thank you. We are back out on the baseball field. We're with Pete Mitsui again. Pete, we mentioned earlier in the broadcast, you helped build this baseball field when you came to Manzanar, is that right? That's right. Uh, of course, we had uh, quite a few other interested people, so I, I didn't have to do too much. Yeah, so you had a lot of work, a lot of oh, help? Oh, yeah. Okay. A lot of help. Does it bring back a lot of memories to be back on this field today? Oh, yes. Certainly do. And you were a pitcher. Uh, you also played first base. This is a, a first baseman's 
mitt, very similar to the one that you might have played with during that time, but you're holding a glove that probably was almost identical to the glove that you used. That's right. We had the five fingers, and it wasn't like food at all. Yeah. Now, you mentioned earlier that you helped form the San Fernando Aces, a famous baseball team here in California. Then you brought the team to Manzanar when everybody was relocated here, and the Aces were quite a club, weren't they? Oh, yes. They, we were one of the stronger teams. And you won the championship in 1943 here That's at Manzanar? Right. Yeah, we took the championship here. Only lost one game that year, is that That's right? That's right. And uh, those are pretty spiffy-looking uniforms that you wore. Where did those come from? Well, I think that uh, they basically ordered them from catalogs, Sears. Okay. And uh, what about equipment, Alex? Well, that's what I've been meaning to ask you. Like, the government said you couldn't bring equipment like bats and stuff like this one right here. So how did you get a hold of them? Well, we tried to bring some in uh, from, uh, ho uh, from home, but... Uh, By smuggling them? No, they, they won't let us bring too many baggies, so we brought a few in, but it wasn't enough. We still had to order them. You had to order it from Sears and Ro That's Roebuck, right. Montgomery Ward. That's right. Okay. Pete, I'm wearing a Cardinals uniform from 1944. The Cardinals won the World Series in 1942 and 1944. Were you aware of what was going on in baseball outside of the camp? No, we really didn't have too much connection with the outside world. So you were isolated here? More or less. And uh, everybody turned out to watch your games? Oh, yes. We uh, had literally thousands of games. So if you look games. along the foul lines here, uh, do you, does it bring back memories of the thousands of people who would have oh, come yes, to watch your games? Very. Must have been quite thrilling. Yes, very much so. Uh, you mentioned that you were not really aware of what was going on in the outside world with baseball. But, uh, for instance, one of the movies that was shown here at Manzanar was Pride of the Yankees about another great first baseman, Lou Gehrig. Lou Gehrig, yeah. yeah. Well, we had heard about Lou Gehrig, and I imagine it was quite interesting for the fans here. Okay. So we've learned a little bit about baseball here at the internment camp. And, Pete, I think you would probably say that baseball was important to helping to boost the morale of people who were in the camp? Well, I think so. I think it was one of the... Uh, solidifying factors of the Japanese people here. You weren't just a baseball player though, you were active in other sports too, is that right? Oh yes, well I played softball and basketball. Yeah. Rosie mentioned the Dusty Chicks, did you ever see the Dusty Chicks play? No, I don't think I ever did. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, well Pete, thanks for sharing your memories of baseball here at Manzanar. We're going to go back to the phones now. Alex, who do we have on the line? We have Sonny from Texas. Sonny from Texas, we need some of your sunshine here today. What's your question? <laughs> Were the interns allowed to take journals or diaries with them to the internment camps? Sonny's question is, were the interns allowed to take journals or diaries into the internment camps to document their experience here? Rosie, do you recall back inside the auditorium, did you have a journal or a diary that you kept? Rosie, Sonny from Texas just asked if the internees were allowed to bring journals or diaries, did you? No, I didn't. Mm. I threw them all away. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but there were other people like uh, the artist Estelle Ishigo, who was at Heart Mountain, who actually did a lot of artwork in yes. camp. And there was a book published from that called Lone Heart Mountain. There was a movie made yeah. called Days of Waiting. Uh, there are a number of people who kept journals and letters uh, when they were in camp and kept them after the camp. And you'll find a lot of them now published in books. Um, one of the great places you can find some of those resources is a, is a website called densho.org. That's D-E-N-S-H-O dot O-R-G. And they have all kinds of documents, thousands of documents on Japanese American history. And you can find a lot of those. Thanks, Sonny. Back to you guys. Alex, who's on the line? Now it's Logan from Michigan. Logan in Michigan. Your question is? Uh, when Japanese Americans were in the internment camps, were they uh, like mad at the Americans for taking them away from their home and uh, land? You know, let's ask Pete that question since we're standing right here. Pete, Logan's question is, when you had to come to the internment camps, were you mad at the American government for taking away your homes and your land? Well, at first we felt that way, but under the circumstances, I think we, most of the people start understanding the situation. 
But you remained patriotic and loyal to America despite yes. these hardships. I think most of the people did. Okay. All right, good. We'll go back to the phones now. Who's our next caller, Alex? It's Jen from Maine. Jen from Maine. Your question? Jen from Maine. You're on the line. Go right ahead. What were some of the jobs they had? What were some of the jobs here at the internment camp? Can we go back out to Block 14? Saburo, you talked a little bit about what uh, the adults did in camp. Do you remember some of the speci specific jobs? Yes. Well, specifically, my father was a cook at the mess hall. My brother was a fireman in the fire department. Uh, every job that was available in camp was really manned by an internee. It was only the upper administrative staff that was uh, filled in by the government people. So the, it was really a small city running their own show. That's right, Saburo. There were many jobs in camp, anything from being the newspaper editor to being a doctor in the hospital to being a teacher in the classroom. Many jobs here at Manzanar. Thanks for your question. Back to you, Jeff and Alex. Okay, thank you, Carrie and Saburo. We have another caller, Alex. We have he Heather from Kansas. All the way out to Kansas. Heather, your question? Yeah, earlier on you in your show, you guys talked about um, fishing. And so what did the people do with the fish that they received from the like river or whatever? Did they take it back and have the cooks cook it for them, or did they sell it within the camp? OK. Heather, let me ask Pete your question. Pete, uh, people went up to the streams in the Sierra Nevada mountains just a little bit beyond here, and they would fish. And when they brought their fish back to camp, what would they do with the fish? Well, I would imagine they, uh, most of the people ate fish. Japanese people like fish. So. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Were there uh, fish shops in the village uh, where maybe fish would be sold to the people? or? I don't think so. No? Were you a fisherman? No, I never was. No? Uh, Saburo, do you ever remember going up and fishing in the streams at the base of the mountains? Yes, we did, Jeff. And we had one advantage. My father worked in the mess hall, and so whatever fishes we brought back, he took to the mess hall, cleaned, and cooked them. Now, there was a, a gratuity that we had to pay, and that is all of the cooking staff got a share of the fish, so we had to split it with them. Very good, Sapporo. Back to you, Jeff and Alex. Okay, I think we have Avery from Tennessee. Avery, your question? Um, with Manzanar the largest camp? Was Manzanar the largest camp? Elisa, back in the Interpretive Center, can you help us with that one? Well, Avery, actually, the, it depends on what time you're talking about, but the largest camps were Tule Lake up in Northern California, especially after it became a segregation center in 1943. It had more than 18,000 people. And then the camp, uh, Poston, Arizona, actually was divided into Poston 1, 2, 3, which the internees called, I think it was Roastin, Toastin, and Dustin. Uh, and there were, I think, more than 17,000 people there. But you can find uh, some of those statistics on our website, or that would be a great question to send over to our panel of experts. Thanks, Avery. Okay, we're back out here on the baseball field, and joining us now is Kerry Onakagawa. Kerry is with the Nisei Baseball Research Project. Kerry, you've been monitoring the discussion forum and the panel of experts. Give us an idea of some of the questions that are being submitted. Well, Alexis from Washington, she said, uh, why were Japanese Americans so into the American pastime baseball when they took away their American civil liberties? And, and baseball really was a, a game they've loved since 1899. It was a game that gave them physical conditioning here at all the 10 camps, uh, especially here at Manzanar, and it was a way to feel like they were back home. And it was just a really a positive way to reconnect with the community and, and a game that they loved. Okay, Carrie, thanks for joining us. I noticed you're wearing an Ichiro practice jersey from the uh, 2006 World Baseball Classic. He's my favorite player, too. And a favorite player of <laughs> Japanese Americans, so. All right, Alex, give us a quick recap of what we've learned in this segment. Okay, well, we've learned how life in camp was for the Japanese Americans, and we also learned how they adapted to camp life, as well as the Japanese gardens in there and baseball. Okay, a lot of great subjects during this last segment, but we're headed to another segment where now we're going to learn about what was like, what was life like after the camp here at Manzanar. Hi, 
welcome to the last Your Turn section. This time we're going to be focusing on life after camp. And the page we're going to be looking at is the Your Turn scrapbook page with the picture of the map on it. And in this part, find your birthday down in the bottom section and follow the instructions to see where you would have gone after camp. I'm a May baby, so like Rosie, who is here with us today, I stayed in camp for three and a half years, then I went back to my home. Callie, what did you do? Well, I was born in September, and on my paper it says that I ended up at Thule Lake, and I could either go to Japan or go home. Alisa, what were some of the other ways that people left camp? Well, you know, people started leaving camp temporarily in 1942 to go out and to harvest crops. They were called agricultural furloughs, and more than a thousand people from Manzanar went out and helped to save the crops because everybody else was off fighting the war. Uh, but as far as leaving permanently, you could leave before the war was over as long as you promised to go east of here. Uh, so like if you went to Chicago or New York and you got a job and had uh, promised not to be a burden in your community. Now, there were other people who left uh, to go to the U.S. military. Either they were drafted or they volunteered. And for Manzanar, there were 174 people uh, who went and served in the military. And actually during the war, you know, there were 26,000 Japanese Americans mm -hmm. serving in the U.S. military. So those people, um, that was another way you could leave. Um, you couldn't actually come back to California until 1945. And when the internees left, did the government give them anything? Well, the government, uh, in most cases, gave internees $25 and a one-way ticket. Thanks, Elisa. And when you're done with that page, you can go back to the other one and fill out what you would do or what you would say when life would be like after Manzanar. And you can compare with everybody else in your class. And now we're going to go to Marissa and Rosie in the auditorium. Thanks, Sophia. So you guys just did the Your Turn activity where you found out what you did after camp. Rosie, what did you do? Well, we had no home to return to, so we were placed in a hostel in Japanese town. And from there, we looked for a job. And I worked for the Los Angeles County and the school districts until my retirement in 1991. Thanks, Rosie. Mm -hmm. So we just heard what Rosie did. Now let's hear from another internee, Alex. Thanks, Marissa. OK, so Pete, just same question as Marissa just asked. What did you do after you got out of camp? Well, of course, I couldn't make my living playing baseball, so I started to work for my good friend, Mr. Pete Andres, in his tar shop. Of course, things were going good until he passed away suddenly, and I was debating what to do. Go, go back to farming, but my brother-in-law came back from the army and he wanted to go in the retail nursery business. So he says, I can't do it by myself. He wanted me to go in with him. So we started the You Need a Garden Nursery. And uh, we wanted to call it You Need a Garden, but everybody kept asking us, are you Mr. You Need a? <laughs> but we were, we stayed there for quite a while, and after, in 1983, I retired, and then I turned the business over to my son, and that, since then, I've been retired. Okay. Okay, now let's go to Block 14 with Carrie and Saburo. Carrie? So, Saab, now that the war is over, where did most people go? Well, about 51% went back to their pre-war homes, but the other 49% were spread out across the USA. So what did they do to get their lives started again? Well, um, you, know, you don't want to look behind. You want to move forward. Uh, you want to be resilient and tough and strong, and you can succeed. So what did you guys do? Where did you go? We moved from Manzanar to Cleveland. Uh, I was a 11-year-old at the time, so I finished elementary school junior high school and high school, <clears throat> went on to college, got my mechanical engineering degree, worked for General Motors for 35 years, and retired. Thank you for sharing, Sabrero. That's one story of many stories. There are 10,000 lives here at Manzanar, 10,000 stories. Many people went on to go to college, went on to move out east. However, uh, we'd encourage you to check out some of the resources we put on your website. 
please go back to Jeff and Alex at this point for another question and answer. Thanks, Carrie. I think we've got about 10,000 calls that are coming into the program right now. We have someone on the line, Alex. We have Caleb from Tennessee. Caleb from Tennessee. Caleb, go ahead. How long did the people stay in Manzanar? How long did they live in Manzanar, Caleb? How long did they stay in oh, Manzanar? Oh, okay. How long did they stay in Manzanar? Pete, can we ask you that question? You came in 1942. How long did you stay here at Manzanar? Oh, we didn't stay too long. We were out in uh, late. People started going out in late 44 and early 45 already. So basically 1942 through 1945, right, yeah. okay? Back to the phones now. We have another question, Alex? It's from, it's Dakota from North Carolina. All right, Dakota from North Carolina. When the Japanese sold their stuff, did they get to keep their money? When those who were interned here, the Japanese Americans, sold their belongings, did they get to keep their money? Elisa, can you and Rosie and the students help us answer that question? So Rosie, Dakota wants to know whether or not when you sold your possessions to come to camp, if your family was able to keep the money. Oh, very little, but yes, we were able to keep the money, yes. Right, so people, when they sold their stuff, they weren't paid the real value no. of it. So whatever money they got, they could keep, yes. but it usually wasn't much. Right. All right, back to you, Jeff and Alex. Okay, now don't forget, if, if you have questions, you can submit those to the discussion forum. Our banks of, bank of experts is standing by, ready to answer them. But we've also got some people here on the show ready to answer this next question, Alex. Okay, it's Jamar from Texas. Okay, from Did Texas. Did they send letters to internees in other camps? Did they send letters to internees in other camps? Carrie, out of Block 14, can your group help us answer that? That's a great question. At times, people had families in many of the different camps. There were 10 different camps throughout the United States, and you could send letters back and forth to different areas. However, it just depended if some of your letters had confidential information in it. Sometimes the government would block out certain words. So yes, you could send letters. However, maybe the whole letter didn't go through. Great question. Back to you, Jeff and Alex. All right, Carrie, thank you for the explanation. Who's next, Alex? It's Jacob from Maine. Jacob in Maine, your question. Jacob, um, were the people in the camp able to hear what's going on about the war in the rest of the world? Okay. Uh, Pete, the question is, when you were living here at the camp, did you get news about World War II that was occurring in other parts of the world? No, I th not that I recollect. So you don't remember hearing too much about what was going on in the outside world while you were Not interned too here? Much. Oh. Oh. Okay. Kay. So we've talked about what happened before the camp, during the camp, and after the camp, but one important aspect of the years after Manzanar was the fact that the government later issued an apology for this terrible injustice. What's the story behind the government apology? In 1988, the U.S. government admitted that what it had done to the Japanese-American people living in the United States during World War II was a mistake. President Ronald Reagan signed the Civil Liberties Act, issuing a formal apology and giving surviving internees a redress payment of $20,000 each. Yes, the nation was then at war, struggling for its survival, and it's not for us today to pass judgment upon those who may have made mistakes while engaged in that great struggle. Yet we must recognize that the internment of Japanese Americans was just that, a mistake. While the government cannot undo the events of the past, the apology was a significant step in healing for Japanese Americans and for learning from our past for all Americans. You know, another key thing that happened after the war was the pilgrimages. Those started here in Manzanar in 1969 when a group of people came up and they started doing an annual pilgrimage every year to raise knowledge of Manzanar and also to lobby to preserve the site. Like Sue Kunitomi Embry worked for more than 30 years to see that this site would be established and it finally was in 1992. But there's another event that happens every year. Marissa, what's that? that, that that event is the Day of Remembrance. On February 19th, every year they have events and exhibits all over the U.S. The reason why it's on February 19th is because that's a very important day to the Japanese American community. That's the day Executive Order 9066 was signed, affecting 120,000 people. 11,070 people are here right now, including Rosie's family and herself, 
and of course my own. But it's not only my family history, it's American history too. It's important to America as well. It's important so that we remember our mistakes, so we know not to do this again. Alex, Jeff. Back to the baseball field now, and we've got a quick wrap up, Alex, of things that we've learned during these last few minutes. Well, we learned about the internees after they got out of camp and the government apology, as well as the pilgrimage and the day of remembrance. Okay, so some important things that we've learned throughout this entire broadcast. We want to thank everybody for joining us. Alex, what do you say to all of the students back in their classrooms? Okay, I thank all of you watching this right now for being so patient and watching us, as well as for your wonderful questions and phone calls. It's been a terrific program, hasn't it, Alex? Mm -hmm. You've been a great co-host. I really appreciate it. We're going to try to get a ball game in yet today, so Alex is going to scoot off and uh, play a little bit of catch. I want to thank all of our sponsors for today's program. Again, on behalf of the National Baseball Hall of Fame and Museum, we're grateful to the National Park Foundation and the National Park Service, especially the terrific staff here at Manzanar National. National Historic Site and of course Ball State University which has produced today's program. Now if you've enjoyed this electronic field trip you're not going to miss we hope the next two electronic field trips that are still to come this spring. April the 17th Ball State University will be bringing you the Indianapolis Motor Speedway going going faster in the story of physics on the speedway and then of course on May the 8th you'll venture to the great Pacific Northwest and Alaska where you'll discover the heritage of Native Americans in that great state. So thank you again for joining us on today's electronic field trip. It's been a pleasure to have been with you today. From Manzanar National Historic Site in California, thank you and have a great day.